Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, in my opinion, basically what primitive years was digging it. If you see, I mean, this was it was covered in a book as we'll touch on in shortly. Is that it was forbidden in the 12th century, 13th century, to say the nature of horrors of Adam. If you if you even said this. We would be excommunicated from the society. So powerful was this objection to this whole thing. So basically, we have the past, and then if you start to say that God does not exist, you jump in agnostic, God is dead, you jump in this God void, or disappearance of God, and you start to lose your perspective of Meaning, morals, values, purpose, right, wrong, good, being, and some other terms. So now we're up to Aristotle. And now Aristotle is basically a, he's a he basically synthesized everything that came before him and did it in a way that he either had to digest him and disprove him wrong or accept him. And that's the way he stood for 2,000 years, not 2,000 years. But mm, 1,700 years. Well, here's here's Aristotle's base. You know, right. So here we have some we respect the thermodynamics. We've got a vessel, and this is called the, the place. So things can go in and out of the place. The place is defined by a boundary. The vessel, and uh, you're gonna have to read his physics to, which is a very intelligent to give him, to say the least. To understand this diagram, but over here we have his universal model. This is on page 49. This is where teleology comes in. So a human is a thing comprised of four elements earth, air, water, and fire. Just as fire, uh, so each thing, for example, human, or a rock, or a flower, or something, has a certain solid to void ratio. So the more void it has in it, the more it wants to rise. The less void it has in it, the more it wants to sink. So fire, in Aristotle's opinion, has a high. or low solid to void ratio it means a little bit of solid and lots of void so it wants to rise and earth has a very high solid to void ratio lots of solid low void it means it wants to sink now humans are in between this which means that you want to depending on what type of human you are you're going to either go you're going to tend to go up or down and uh, he, he, he thought about Plato's soulmate theory in, time, in, in kind of in terms of this. And so he said each person is void with a born or synthesized with a certain solid to void ratio. And we're split in half by one of the gods, maybe Thor, maybe. Aristotle might not have said this, said this explicitly, we're destined to find our soulmate. And we're going to move around the earth to we find our soulmate based on our solid void ratio. Once we find the, per the soulmate, we'll combine 
and I'll be at peace. So a lot of people still believe this basically intelligent but incorrect model. Maybe not intelligent, but intelligent for the year it was professed. Now we have the Dark Ages. So we're at page 51 now, we're going to start speeding forward so we can summarize things quickly. But, uh, basically, they started to condemn what we could learn. Starting humans started to condemn after they burn Hypatia and Fifth century and all the way up until about the 14th century. So, yeah, forbidden condemnation of 1277, number 152, says it is forbidden to teach that the theological discussions are based on fables. Well, we know this is true now. All theology is based on mythologies and fables. Uh, this is basically... Uh, <coughs> this isn't probably important here. Even scientists are so old right now, according to about 2,000 or 1995 polls, less than 5% believe in God, but um, the general populace, this uh, general random scientists are about 40% believe in God, and the population is about, in America is about around 90 to 88% <coughs> believe in God, so here we are, we're just lost in a lot of confusion. And we have over here, this is the way to get out of the condition right here, it's called the Human Chemical Thermodynamic Macroview, this is called the Thermodynamic Lens. And to, uh, 2014 views of Mark Donahue, a chemical engineer, and Richard Kilberg and their leadership and organizational behavior, a thermodynamic inquiry article. So they said we should look at everything thermo chemical thermodynamically. So instead of thinking about everything, or you look at someone from below, like here. Instead of thinking of yourselves as you know, like uh, a, B, I've got some kids, I have a bond with my wife, I've got a soul, I'm going to go to the afterlife. You should think about yourself 
uh, the chemical, human chemical thermodynamics looks at you from above. Where we use the variables energy, turn on energy, entropy, enthalpy, free energy to explain why exactly move around work. How do you work? So, search for example, <coughs> uh, my neighbors just like night last, last two nights were just arguing screaming at each other all night long for 24 hours straight and uh, they, she put her basically put a restraining order on the guy she was B he was A their relationship wasn't working anymore so work is a it, it can be explained thermodynamically instead of fumbling around with restraining orders and calling your landlord and all that you can you can work you can deal with this chemical thermodynamically. So these these uh, psychologists, this chemical engineering is, so basically you can look at everything in terms of the chemical thermodynamic lens. Right here, this is what it looks like. Here we have uh, Puro's chapter. <clears throat> Basically, here of Alexandria, he was basically a reprinter of Satibius's work that came before him. But he published this little thing called the Pneumatica in 50 AD about all these different. Uh, air steam inventions that you can they were using back in Greece like if you eat a fire if you eat a boiling water right here the water can go the steam can go up this pipe and make this thing spin or you can use you can use the steam to power open temple doors or you can use this horse turning around to, to use these pumps right here Let's see where it is. These look like piston cylinders. All this stuff was done 200 AD. Piston and cylinder thermodynamics. Not necessarily thermodynamics, but uh, uh, Hero basically reprinted all it. He published this whole thing like it was just trivial childish knowledge in 15 AD. But of course, since we were in the Dark Ages, we, we didn't pay any attention to this. But in about between the years 1200 AD and 1400 AD, all these heroes' pneumatica began to be, became translated into Italian and Latin, and that's where the not exactly the invention of steam engine happened, but people started building these heat-based engines. So it's hard to explain, but he's he's like a key. He's a key linchpin. Connects us back to the Greeks. So here we are. Most people don't know. I didn't know about this until a month, probably sorry, a month ago, once, maybe two months ago. Da Vinci made a heat engine either in his mind or he actually built a little thing out of a cannon barrel. Inverted vertically upside down. It's called the Da Vinci Heat Engine 1508. And I mean, look at this Leslie White. Okay, Leslie, Leslie White didn't know about that thing, but some people did know about this thing. So he took this, this is where he's a sketches. He took a cannon barrel, 1508, he inverted it, he put uh, gunpowder inside. And the thing had a release valve and exploded the gunpowder. So the explosion of the gunpowder, uh, the gases went out of the thing, the, the volume, this is the volume. It created a, a void inside because there was no uh, molecules 
to block out the pressure of the, the atmosphere. Of course, Aristotle didn't see it this way in his years, but he knew that if you exploded the gunpowder, it would raise this weight. So he created the, one of the first heat engines. And Basically, what he was doing. There's his engine. You have to read through more to see what he's talking about here. And this is now we get to the social system. Can't really cover this right now in verbal details because it's very complicated. But there's you inside of a pistol and cylinder, and basically, you have to explain your own existence in terms of chemical thermodynamics. Starting with Da Vinci. Then Galileo had this pump problem. How are you going to pump water from this water reservoir over this hill into the home? So many. This guy named Giovanni Bellini came to this problem. Came to him with this problem in 1630, and he said, "Well, what's going on here?" And Aristotle, of course, had to be a very intelligent person. He had to put forward an answer. So. Uh, these are the pumps he called Galileo. Galileo came up with this model called Measure the Three. This is in 32. This theoretical device. This is the piston. Right? right, this is the cylinder. That's the piston. And this is the system. He said if you pull, put every one in here, you put weights in here and you pull down this thing, you could eventually break the back the back end. And he published this in 38 and this pretty much changed the world. So for example these guys birdie made a water column vacuum experiment. 39 after reading Gallery in Italy after he, right, in Rome. The, it says 50 copies of Galileo's dialogues on the two new sciences reached Rome in December of 38, which was the diagram we just saw. Okay, so after these 50 copies reached Rome, they started building these. They started making these experiments where you can build these rich people would test these uh, things to the side of their houses. There. One, two, three. Of course, you got a four story house and nothing to do, you might as well do experiments. And so, this guy, Bertie, attached one of these vacuum bulbs to the side of his house, which was you take a thing of water and turn it upside down. And uh, originally it was full of water, but then when you turn it up, so down there would be a space and there's no water. This is a glass left above it. So this is, people didn't know what this was. They said, "Well, what is this? A vacuum?" And. Uh, even got to the point where they put bells inside of it to see well the sound travel in the vacuum. And this was the uh, invention of Kircher. And that's this Kircher. But in respect to thermodynamics, this is like a stepping stone. So here we get this is the Torricelli. No, this is the birdie. The basic the just of the birdie. He took a water, he flipped it upside down, put it in there, and there was a void left on top. And that's Bertie. Thing attached to the side of the house, there was 18 cubits 
a rose eating cupids and they say, well, is this a vacuum or not? And people de debated this whole thing because it had to, had to, had to do with a lot with uh, the theology. And then Torricelli completed the same experiment because he had learned either from Galileo or another student of Galileo's and talked about mercury being dense with the water, you can make a smaller version of this little thing. So he took a mercury and he flipped it over and he saw there was a vacuum inside of the sock. Like this. And there's a bunch of experiments. <coughs> the bob at the top was where it disproved there was something about different volumes. You can read it. You can read the whole thing online. Or not online, but in this book. Hmm. And then Pascal wrote about Torstad and he said, well, if this is true, I should be able to start with one of these Torstad vacuums at the bottom of the mountain, carry it to the top, and it should be lower at the top. And he, he did this experiment, or his brother in law did the experiment, and he found the Hypothesis to be true. Here's the, here's the composition of air. Basically, there is 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Skipping over a little bit, up to Garrick. In the 1640s, they invented the telescope. Uh, Galileo was, was the first to use it to point at the skies. And, a, and they found that the stars were, or the fixed stars, supposed they were different than what had previously been supposed. Particularly, there's Lipper, Lipper says, sit it down. And there's his, one of his customers. So, and Lippershire is in, thinking about the invention of the telescope, which Galileo later adopted. So, in Buerk's mind, this is the previous model by Copernicus. Everything was just like the fixed stars, the little, the little dots on the outside of the, the final circle. They're all fixed. But now with this new telescope, We've got these new fixed stars that are scattered around. So in between these fixed stars, there has to be a uh, vacuum. Not a vacuum, but space. And Buick wanted to experimentally measure this space or vacuum. And that's basically, you can start from this and go right from all the way through to energy and entropy and thermodynamics and the whole field of thermodynamics from this little experiment. But Here he measures the. You see right here. He's got the Galileo thing. He, um, it's not for sure whether he knew about this, but he, he cites Galileo by uh, 16. And this is this is a uh, 47 experiment. So I don't know if he learned about Galileo by this time, but it's. He learned about Galileo by in the 60s. He's got two guys trying to make a vacuum inside of a barrel. And he's got here's his vacuum pump, which is basically called fire squared and reversed him. And now he tries to make a vacuum within a vacuum, which is curious. And he puts one vacuum, one barrel, inside of another barrel. There's a water strong in the first barrel and he tries to evacuate the, the inner barrel. Just 
very intelligent at this time of And then we got the history of the evolution of vacuum pumps. Oops. Well, yeah, I didn't pay attention to hook and boil and hydrogens and papin, because papin is where the carnal hydrogen comes from. You see, I'm trying to use it. So, the barrels he uses two copper spheres right here, and this is one year, two years later. That's his second generation vacuum pump. And I always take pictures over here. Very interesting. And then this is where kind of the shit hits the pan, if you will say. Started to show. There's a vacuum. This is called the, the bulb. The, the little guy's holding the thing right here is called the re receiver. If you can, originally, they, the guy would have to connect it to the vacuum pump and suck out the air out and then you would connect it to the little boiler right here would connect it to the piston and cylinder engine and then because there's a complete vacuum inside because they already pumped the air out it would suck the air down and to the astonishment of everybody surrounding would pull down in the piston and jerk all these 20, 30 men forwards. And everybody was just astonished by this whole thing. And then he started getting quantitative, started measuring the weight that you could measure by the force of the vacuum. And, uh, and then he goes diagrams, the little, little details here. I thought there's actually this piston.